Thank you uh, all for joining. I'm sorry, I think I look like a rock star today, although I don't feel like one. Uh, I think we're webcasting this so, or, or recording it. Um, I wanted to talk today about active investing, activist investing, how trends are developing uh, in this area of investor relations, what this means for investor relations officers, uh, what we can all do about these trends, what we can't do, um, and kind of just talk about some of the developments we've seen in the market. Um, before I go into some of the, the trends we're seeing, I wanted to start with a definition. Uh, I wanted to, to quickly go through what is active investing and what is activist investing. This may sound fairly uh, uh, pedantic to discuss uh, uh, definitions, but I actually think it's very important. I think the two are actually converging, uh, and, and that's what we've seen over the last few years. Active shareholders, I think we're all familiar with them. They're typically more traditional shareholders. They can be long funds. Uh, they can be pension funds, um, interested in the long-term development of a company, uh, but they consider themselves active participants in the development of that company and the development of that company's equity. Uh, if they don't agree with a company's position on something, they're going to come and actively tell you that they don't agree with it. They're going to bring you uh, alternative solutions, alternative suggestions, um, on, on how to address those issues, uh, and they're going to use their shares at the AGM to vote for or against certain resolutions, and, and sometimes actually presenting resolutions of, them, of their own. The, the old paradigm, which was always the case, and I think Warren Buffett is one of the most famous investors for having said this has changed, is the old paradigm used to be if you don't like a company's position on something, sell go someplace else. Use your vote uh, to sell your shares rather than trying to, to incite change. What we've seen over the last decade is this paradigm has fundamentally shifted, and I'm going to talk about that in, in a little bit. What are some of the great examples we've seen in Germany um, of, of this type of shareholder engagement? Uh, we saw in 2004, DECA um, uh, putting through resolutions um, initiated by hedge funds. We've seen DWS, one of the most traditional fund managers in this market, become more proactive in terms of their stance on M&A as a particular issue um, and becoming more vocal about the positions that companies take. So very traditional investors becoming more engaged publicly and behind the scenes with companies. If we switch over and think about activist investors. Uh, these are the ones that everybody kind of talks about as Heuschrecken when we originally uh, go back to those, that language moving from private equity into the hedge fund world. Short-term focused investment, looking to make a, a quick buck on corporate action, corporate change, using the public arena to incite that change, uh, certainly trying to use the public arena to put pressure on management uh, to, to make changes. We've seen waves of, of activist investing over the last decade. Um, certainly this is a trend that came out of the US with very aggressive hedge funds. Uh, it moved into the UK in the early 2000s and, and we give an example here of TCI actually taking their investment strategy into Germany. Uh, people who are not familiar with TCI, the Children's uh, um, uh, Investment Corporation, uh, a very aggressive hedge fund um, previously. Um, and, and using their usually small stakes in companies to make very big positions uh, publicly. That continued on and we saw another wave of it in 2007 with a very famous Swedish investor, Sivian, coming into the German market, buying up Munich Re and, and trying to incite change there. Rumored to have been invested in three other DAX companies. Um, most recently, their position in DMAG Cranes, uh, resulting one way or the other in that company being sold to a US company, Terex. And then I've put down here Hermes um, as an activist investor. And I was recently on a panel with uh, Mr. Herd, uh, Hermes' uh, corporate governance uh, individual. Uh, he probably would not like me considering them an activist investor. Uh, they consider themselves a traditional investor that engages with companies. However, their stance has become, in my view, more aggressive in the last years publicly, using public venue to try to incite change. Uh, and you'll also see, and I put this on the last bullet points, you'll even see legal action being taken by hedge funds to try to get companies to change, and that's very true in the Netherlands, where we recently saw uh, U.S. investors split up TNT, the post network there, uh, and then eventually get TNT currently in the process of being sold to UPS through very aggressive 
legal and public action. So that's just a, a very general overview of how those two sides work. The, the points I want to come on to is what's happening in these different pools of investment. Um, if we look first at hedge funds, uh, which are, are known for being short-termist, um, although I don't think that's always fair, uh, are known for employing more aggressive investment strategies, which is certainly fair. Uh, what's happened over the last decade? Um, what we've seen is, and the, the chart on the left is showing here, the, the hedge fund universe. You have launches going up and you have closures coming down. Obviously, uh, as we saw the, the dot-com boom uh, and the investment boom of the early 2000s, we had huge increases in the number of hedge funds being launched. Um, there was even a famous one being purported by uh, Bill Clinton years ago uh, as a hedge fund that every investor should be able to invest in. Um, but as we see the financial crisis hit, uh, we see a dramatic number of closures to where actually net-net you're probably talking closures more than openings of hedge funds. Um, and, and what's happening here? Uh, performance fees, the hedge funds industry has been known for charging a 2 and 20 model, which means they get 2% management fee and 20% on the upside. Uh, that's how they make their money. It's a very aggressive funding model. Uh, you have to, to believe that you're going to make that. Um, but they charge the 20% above their high water marks. Now, if we think about what's happened in the last few years, uh, two-thirds of the hedge funds in 2011 were below their high water mark which means they weren't earning any of that 20% fee. Uh, and you have a lot of investors that were actually going back to hedge funds and saying, I don't know why I'm paying you 2% to manage that money when you haven't delivered a, a substantial return to me. So a lot of pressure coming in there. If you think of 18% uh, of hedge funds uh, are, uh, are more than 20% below their high water mark, you can imagine as an institutional investor invested in those hedge funds, they're going to be looking at the numbers very closely. Uh, and 13% of hedge funds haven't delivered a performance fee back to their owner uh, since 2007. So a very challenging market for hedge funds. What is this actually resulting in in terms of, of market engagement? Um, smaller funds are not able to absorb that type of loss. Uh, the the fly-by-night kind of hedge funds that popped up, uh, Goldman spun I think 500 hedge funds out of the Goldman universe popped up in the years 2000 to 2007. Uh, smaller hedge funds that weren't able to survive, so they're going to be declining. We're going to see more closures from those. Uh, and those hedge funds that survive are going to be more aggressive in having to earn that performance fee. So they're going to be employing, uh, employing more use of leverage, higher risk. They're going to have to take bigger bets on a, a fewer number of situations to try to adjust this model. Um, what's happening on the institutional investor side? Now, the institutional investors are the largest investors in hedge funds. It's their diversification strategy. Um, you basically pretty much have every institutional investor has a portion of their, their investment put into a hedge fund pool in one form or another. In the US, this was very popular and continues to be popular. TIA, CREF, which is one of the pension funds, state pension funds for uh, uh, teachers and, and college professors, um, is one of the largest investors in hedge funds in the world. Um, a very uh, stable fund. Now, what they're doing is they're looking at those performance models and they're saying, something doesn't quite fit here. We need to understand more of how you're able to deliver as a hedge fund the returns that we're going to be expecting for the risk that we're taking on in terms of these portfolios. Um, and, and what they're doing is they're putting more and more pressure on hedge funds to deliver transparency. And at the same time, they're increasing their allocations to hedge funds. So they're not moving away from this asset class. All they're saying is we're going to maintain or put more money in this asset class, but we expect more transparency from hedge funds as to how they're going to deliver the returns we expect. Now, this is an interesting development. Historically, hedge funds have often operated in the black box model. Uh, we have a trading strategy as a hedge fund. It's very proprietary, uh, and that's our differentiator. Uh, and nobody else can know about that, and as long as we deliver their turns, everybody's happy. Institutional investors are saying that's no longer good enough for us. One, because you're not delivering the returns, uh, and, and two, because it increases our risk if we don't understand what your trading strategy is. So we have a, a bit of a dichotomy here. 
We have on the one hand hedge funds being required to deliver performance fees, taking on more risk and more leverage to do so in a more challenging market environment. And institutional investors are saying, fine, but we want more transparency on what you're doing. Now, how do you reconcile the two it is very much still open. But what they're kind of doing is hedge funds are becoming IR professionals in a different, in a different world. They're starting to professionalize their own investor engagement as they go out to institutional investors and talk to them about the funds, how they're, how they're raising funds, uh, and, and how they're going to deliver. The other trend we're seeing in a global context, but particularly in a European context, and we heard a little bit of a uh, reference this morning in the, the speech from Frau Moll, um, is, is what's happening in terms of lit and dark trading venues. So we have institutional investors pushing for more transparency, but on the other side, actually, in terms of trading flows for companies, we have less transparency coming through. Um, the pie chart is basically breaking down what are lit and dark venues. Lit venues are anything that goes over the uh, normal exchanges and trades. We all have fairly good transparency on that. You pull up your Bloomberg terminal, uh, and you can get a pretty good look at what's happening in volume on your own stock on a given day. Dark venues are exactly how they sound, dark. You don't have transparency into who the trading counterparties are. You don't really have clarity on when trades are clearing, because they're off exchange. They're usually bilateral trades between parties, facilitated. There are a number of, of exchanges out there. Turquoise is probably the biggest one that does dark trading. Uh, and institutional investors, hedge funds, are able to use these venues to trade larger blocks of stock without being noticed uh, on the market, so able to do that with relative security of not affecting the share price. If we look at it, the DAX equities overall, 57% roughly uh, in 2011 were in lit venues. Uh, that gives you the, the 40 plus percent that's actually traded dark, um, which means institutions, companies, have much less transparency into who actually is trading their stock. So again, we're trying to put together puzzle pieces on what's actually happening in the background. We have aggressive hedge funds taking on greater leverage and risk. We have institutional investors asking for more transparency. And as companies and IR officers, we have much less of an idea of what's actually happening in our stock on a daily basis. We wanted to take one example um, and, and look at a specific DAX company and how that's developed over the last just year. Um, and if you look here, uh, this is a DAX 30 company, um, and you know you can go and find how trading of your stock, your company's stock, or another company's stock functions by going through Bloomberg. Um, you can look here and say that's pretty much in line with what's happening in the DAX in general. Uh, you have 54% trading lit uh, and the remainder dark. That's increased from less than 40% dark last year uh, to, to where it is today. Um, a dramatic change in just one year. And this is a, a, a result of actual legislation that was meant to come in at the EU level to address transparency. Um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with MIFID uh, at the EU level. I, I, it's very complicated, but I recommend <laughs> taking a look at it. Uh, this is the, um, the regulation out of the EU on trading hedge fund initiatives. Um, and actually, the intention of this regulation was to increase transparency. What it end up, ended up doing was giving the option for dark trading platforms to be created. Uh, and currently, there's MIFID 2, which is under consultation in the EU, uh, which should address some of these issues. But as we always learn with the markets, if you close one door, they find another way to make money. Um, the other side of this is we're seeing an increasing share of high frequency trades, algo trades, uh, uh, as they're named, um, where at the DAX, it's approximately 50% are, are being transacted with, uh, with high frequency trades in the US. It's almost 3 fourths. Um, Again, coming back to this point of how, as an IR officer with, these, with this background, are you able to understand your share price movements, know who your investors are, and engage, um, understanding that on the other side of this equation, you have an aggressive group of people who's looking to make short-term gains on the stock. So that's a bit of the, what is the, what's happened in the world in the last few years. Now, I just want to spend a little bit of time on impact on IROs, 
uh, and then some recommendations, because I don't want to leave everybody here with just uh, some negative sentiment. Um, impact on IROs. Uh, the basic statement I'm trying to make is that investors are going to become more active. Um, I mentioned I was with uh, uh, Chris Haird uh, recently of Hermes. Uh, he spent a lot of time talking about the stewardship code that's been put in place in the UK. There's similar legislation coming in in the US, which is actually requiring institutional investors to play a more active role in their investments with companies. Um, I just read this morning in the Handelsblatt that actually this year in Germany you're going to have record turnout of institutional investors at AGMs. Um, I'm question a little bit uh, where the data comes from, but I think it's an interesting direction. That through the crisis, fund managers did not take a whole lot of blame for what happened. Uh, fund managers who voted for um, M&A, voted for takeovers, voted for executive compensation schemes, voted for share buybacks, voted for leverage. Um, they're being pushed now by governments around the world to be more active in their investments. Uh, and so we definitely think that's a trend that's going to continue um, and that companies need to understand that that engagement is not always aggressive, um, but in initially is going to feel a little bit uncomfortable as the, as the companies uh, come to terms with it. Activist investors, we also think, are going to be more aggressive. And there, the challenge is, how do you differentiate between the two? Uh, it's not just hedge funds are activists and traditional funds are not. Um, it doesn't, unfortunately, work that easily in this world. Uh, you can have both activists who are traditional fund managers and active investors who are hedge funds. IROs have less information about their shareholder base. Uh, and I think what's, what's really interesting in a German context is when we talk about ad hoc relevance and divergence from consensus, how relevant is consensus in the current market given the sell side analysts are trading, those houses are trading a much lower percentage of stock on the market compared to what your overall volume is. I think that's a question that nobody in this market or any market has really dealt with, which is how relevant is analyst consensus anymore uh, and the implications for, for ad hoc uh, um, announcements. Um, and, and with the, the, the lower liquidity that we're going to see in the market through traditional venues, how, do in, how does investor relations reach out to those investors that are truly our holders? How do you know who those investors actually are? If I think about some recommendations um, for, for IROs, uh, you know, the first one it comes back to we have to understand the changes and the, the developments. Uh, I think it's impossible for us all to keep up with all the developments, particularly in financial instruments across Europe. Um, it, it, keeping up with just dark pools and dark venues and algo trading is, is enough. If you try to keep up with MIFID, MIFID II, and the rest, um, it, it becomes challenging. But certainly in, in venues like this, exchanging what each one of us has experienced, um, using the DIRC certainly as a, a venue for exchanging information on what are the trends that we're all seeing. You have to understand the specific sta situation in your company. I know this may sound obvious, um, but actually uh, w recently with a number of companies, just understanding the percentage of trading and holding that's going on from dark and, and lit venues is not known to most companies, I would say, today. Unless you specifically went out and looked for this, it's not something that would normally come across your desk as an IRO. Um, you have to look at what are the trading patterns, what's really moving our stock, um, can you get a good handle on your share register, and I know that this is a particular point in Germany, um, I've worked here in a, uh, for a number of years, uh, where if you, in, even if you have Namensaktien, you have a very challenging time getting behind the share register. Uh, I think there may be some legislation that needs to come into place to try to address that. Um, if you have bearer shares, you have an even more difficult time. Uh, but getting some more clarity in your share register, uh, I think, is certainly a starting point. You obviously have to have a good relationship with your investors. I mean, I think this goes without saying. Um, that typically, if we're saying on the one hand investors are going to be more active, you should hear from them. Um, engage with them. Uh, make sure you're not using the sell side as your interlocutor. The sell side is your, your mouthpiece to the market. Uh, as they're 
involvement and influence will probably be less as time goes on. Um, understanding the perception, and this comes back to the activist point, uh, if you have a good feeling and a, a rigid process for understanding what is the market's perception of our business over time uh, that you can argue publicly against certain points of activists, uh, that's a, a very powerful tool. Uh, and certainly corporate governance. And I haven't really touched on it, but this is a huge topic in the activist world right now, has been for a number of years, is they typically use corporate governance as their wedge in. Uh, and I would say for right or for wrong, Germany has been criticized for its corporate governance structures in the past um, by international investors. I would argue that the you know, developments of the last few years have actually shown that the corporate governance model here works fairly well. Uh, and I think that's a point that probably needs to be made more aggressively. And then the last point on focus on the long term. Again, this sounds easier said than done, um, but it's a trend we're seeing in, in a lot of markets, uh, this move away from quarterly guidance, which was a very big trend in the U.S. years ago, uh, moving away from even more extensive quarterly reporting beyond what's required, uh, and trying to focus people on long-term long -term strategy, long-term delivery. Um, it's, if you're trying to get away from an activist model, and you're trying to say you're not going to be able to have a quick flip on a corporate action with this stock, you need to present the market with the alternative. So uh, I think all of us, having, having done this myself, all of us kind of fall back into what's our quarterly report, what's our financial update, how have we done versus last year's uh, comparable. Absolutely right, have to do that. Um, but I think trying to also present the long-term strategy uh, of a business um, is essential as we move into this more stakeholder uh, model of investor engagement. That's a very quick overview that I wanted to just run through. Um, I think this is a topic that is going to uh, go with us over the next few years. Um, I was just listening to the McKinsey report earlier where they were talking about the lack of demand that's going to be coming in for equities over the ne next decade, uh, the funding gap that, that's going to be coming out. And I think as we all look at these trends that are developing as investor relations professionals and thinking about our job is to find a, a fair price for capital for our company uh, and compete effectively, um, that, that keeping abreast of how these trends are developing and the impact on us is, is absolutely essential. That's all from me. Um, I'm happy to take questions, um, if there are any. Yeah. Um, I've been through this with a, you say, more direct dialogue with investors. I've been through that. I'm a little bit skeptical uh, to their giving input to listening to them. I mean, how, how is your experience? I mean, it's fairly easy to share. Yeah. Um, my experience is, is much to your, uh, uh, the same as yours. It, it's challenging. Um, I think it, you have to look at one, the size of your company, the size of the free float, the interest uh, that there is from the investment community uh, out there. But on the flip side, and I've, I've experienced this very directly, is investors tend to be skeptical individuals. Uh, they're constantly questioning and they're very, um, they're very negative at times as well, especially in the last few years. Uh, and while you may not think that the interaction with them is having an impact, uh, over time I, I have to disagree. Um, that, y you know, I, I once had a conversation with an investor and talked about, you know, what's your time horizon to invest from a new company? Uh, and she said it, it's usually the fourth or fifth meeting with the company that I'll actually make a decision to invest or not to invest. Um, it goes that long. Uh, and if a company's not willing to come and meet with me during that amount of time, and this was Dodge and Cox, and they take a large stake in a company, it's usually 5%, her comment was, I'm not interested. Um, so it, it is a long game in some situations. That being said, I understand the last couple of years, three years, have been investors really don't want to hear the long-term story. They only want to hear what's happening next week. Do I need to trade out of the stock? Do I need to trade into the stock? Um, but I think a constant attempt at engaging with companies, is, uh, investors, is essential. Would you suggest maybe doing a test run and, and just getting in investors? 
I don't, actually. And, and I think it's more important who is the hedge fund than just the label hedge fund, uh, to be honest. Um, and who is the traditional investor rather than just, I mean, again, Fidelity is your classic example. Fidelity, global player, well known um, as a traditional investor. Uh, in 2010, their average investment period was six months. Now, that's not a long-term investor at six months. I've got hedge funds that have been in stocks longer than that. Um, and I think you really have to understand who is the fund manager I'm talking to or fund managers, uh, what's their position, what's their time horizon, how do I fit, uh, rather than just splitting traditional and, and hedge fund, because uh, unfortunately it's not as easy as that. And, you know, it's, it's been our experience as well as yeah. both in-house and advising companies, of course. Uh, and you get some companies with managements that, that see the value, like doing it. You get some that, that don't. Um, I, I think a particular point with hedge funds, though, which I think is, is part of what I'm trying to say here, is regardless of whether you want to or not engage with these investors, they're going to try to engage with you. They're going to be more aggressive going forward. Uh, and like anything in life, if you offer the opportunity, you're probably going to get a better response than if they force you to do it, uh, which they will um, at, at some point. Uh, I mean, when we heard this morning um, the trend of uh, proportionally mayor in more international owners uh, of German stocks than domestic, that comes with a certain attitude on ownership that is very Anglo-Saxon um, and is quite different, and I think that's spilled over. The, the argument, though, that and this has been my experience, it's not always the case when you sit across from a, a hedge fund manager, um, but often those are the people that managements like to meet with because they really know what they're talking about. Now that's, again, that's not always the case. You still get the 22-year-old across the table who thinks he knows how to tell you how to run your business. Um, and that doesn't go over too well sometimes. Uh, but the hedge funds that have limited positions but take sizable positions in those companies that they investment, invest in, usually spend a lot of time researching uh, and come with very good questions and very knowledgeable questions where you go to DWS and you know they're buying a DAX stock, they're buying it because they have to weight it because uh, they're benchmarked to the index. Uh, they don't really care. They just want to know, do I overweight or underweight? Because I got to own it. Uh, and that's a very different discussion. Um, and I try to make this point with management, not always possible, but as, a, as an argument is those people are sitting every single day in meetings with your peers and competitors as companies. Ask them what they think. Don't use it as just a, hey, I sit down, they fire their questions at me, and I answer them, and we all go home. Um, and if they don't buy, it was a waste of time. Uh, they use you as information sources. Use them as information sources. Uh, and, uh, and actually, most of them, not, again, not all, uh, but most of them are pretty happy to talk to you um, about their perceptions of you and, and your peer group. I think that's the trend that's happening. I mean, one, you're seeing a, a significant decline in sell-side coverage in general, the number of analysts covering a stock, the number of houses covering a stock. Uh, when you drop out of the DAX 30, it drops off dramatically. If, if you think about U.S. context, 
Uh, it's something like 30 or 40 percent of the S&P 500 has no analyst coverage uh, at all. Um, and so analysts are becoming less relevant in one respect and less knowledgeable. But I think if you look at, at the percentage of dark venue trading, um, how can analyst consensus represent a market view? Um, uh, yes, they do more research on the companies themselves, but are they actually able to transport that consensus to investors who are buying the stock, which in the end of the day is what we're trying to measure? Uh, I, I do think something needs to change there. Germany is very, and the UK is exactly the same way, is very reliant on the analyst consensus model as the basis for whether or not you're in line or out of line with guidance. Uh, I think something has to change there. Um, Yeah, it's already a gray area, unfortunately. But, um, but I, you know, I think there, there could be, I don't know when this would happen, but I think there could be a transition to if information is price sensitive, regardless of whether or not it's in line or out of line with ex expectations, that information needs to be communicated publicly and broadly. I think that's probably what 90% of the DAX companies and German companies do anyway, is if you have material information, you're going to put out a statement to the market. And you're going to put it out in a timely fashion. Um, I don't know why there has to be a differentiation then with the ad hoc rules. Any other questions? No? All right, well, um, uh, these slides are not in on the stick. I apologize for that. Uh, if anybody would like them, I'm happy to send them to you. Just uh, give me a business card or let me know. Um, and happy to send them through to you. Otherwise, um, I appreciate all of your time uh, coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the days here uh, today and tomorrow at the conference. Thanks.